Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Campbell Paul, um, and uh, uh, I'm the president of WAIM, and it's an absolute honour and, a, and a, a great excitement to welcome you all again to uh, the next of the series of webinars that uh, WAIM has been providing for, for members and for others uh, interested in working in the area of infant mental health. Um, before we commence, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the um, uh, owners of the land uh, where I'm sitting uh, this evening. Um, uh, the, um, I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who've been the custodians of the land within Australia for thousands and thousands of years. And I acknowledge and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And in doing so, um, I acknowledge the um, crucial role, the importance um, of uh, the indigenous peoples of the world and the peoples uh, who are caring for our planet, uh, especially at this time of, uh, uh, of crisis with uh, um, the worldwide pandemic and uh, concerns about the progress of our uh, climate around the world. Um, so uh, again, I'd like to acknowledge people who've cared for this land over so many uh, millennia and uh, welcome you to our webinar this evening. As I say, I'm Campbell Paul and I'm an infant psychiatrist at the uh, Royal Children's and the Royal Women's Hospital here in Melbourne. Um, and as uh, president of WAIM, uh, it gives me uh, great pleasure to um, be able to uh, introduce uh, our chair for this evening, for this morning, for today, um, uh, Professor Hisako Watanabe from uh, Tokyo. Um, Hisako has uh, been uh, an amazing um, uh, contributor to WAIM Foundation of our um, uh, executive group um, and has uh, been working tirelessly within uh, Asia, within the world generally, um, as a, um, a major contributor and organiser of our activities, thoughts, and our um, commitment to infants and families. Hisako is going to be chairing the session today, um, and uh, uh, she's um, very um, uh, creatively uh, engaged uh, um, uh, Professor Bob MD, Emeritus Professor Bob MD from Denver, um, past president and uh, 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 esteemed colleague uh, from WAIM to um, participate in the webinar. Um, Bob MD is going to join us by uh, a video recording uh, as he's uh, not been able to attend in person, but uh, I know for me and for all of you, it's an, an amazing honour to have uh, uh, Professor MD join us. Um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, Hisako's uh, contribution uh, and uh, her introduction of uh, Professor MD. Um, this will be followed by uh, Professor David Oppenheim from uh, Tel Aviv. Um, Actually, just to mention the title again for our webinar, Looking Back, Looking Forward, Learning from Our Pioneers as We Adapt and Move into the Future. I think this is a really uh, apposite uh, uh, topic for us tonight. As I mentioned, we've got a lot on our hands as uh, citizens in the world uh, to care for our uh, infants uh, and their families. And uh, I hope we're going to learn a lot from our pioneers and a lot from the new uh, pioneers such as uh, Isako, David Oppenheim and our um, other key speaker is uh, um, uh, Professor Diane Phillip from Toronto and Diane's going to talk about video conferencing with the very young challenges and opportunity really taking us forward into the future how are we going to adapt and uh, uh, provide for uh, infants, families um, who are not able to be present in our clinical rooms uh, and how we can reach out further and further into supporting infants and families. Uh, 
And then I have to uh, really acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Chaya Kukani from Toronto, from Infant Mental Health Promotion at Sick Kids in Toronto, who with uh, Donna Hill uh, from the Infant Mental Health Promotion Office has done so much to get us to this point in the webinar. And we'll hear more from uh, Chaya later as she's going to um, coordinate some of the discussion and questions. Um, all of this is part of the process of uh, the um, exciting uh, new um, uh, format for our Congress in Brisbane next year in, at the end of June. So we will have a, a hybrid conference. There'll be people face to face on the ground in Brisbane and we're expecting um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people, maybe a thousand people around the world joining us um, through the uh, the uh, facilities of uh, Zoom and uh, the, the internet. So um, welcome everyone. And uh, it's my absolute pressure to hand over to uh, Hisaka Watanabe from Tokyo and Professor Bob MD uh, from Denver to kick off our webinar. Thank you so much. Welcome. Hello everyone. Welcome to WEM webinar four. I'm Hisako Watanabe from Tokyo, and it is a great honor for me to chair this webinar. The highlight of today is introducing our revered Professor Robert MD. It's five o'clock in the morning in Denver, so he can't join, but instead we recorded a Zoom um, greeting from him. And before starting this greeting, I'd like to remind you two things. One is about questions and discussions. Because of the limited time, I'm afraid we cannot take in questions um, after each presentation, but we would rather do it at the end. But in the meantime, you can put up your questions on the chat box and the organizing committee will you know, keep an eye on the chat box and we'll select the most you know, relevant questions and discussions to be discussed by Dr. Chaya Kurkani at the end. Well, discussion is very important. So we, also offer for those who want to discuss more to remain after the webinar because the organizing committee and some of the discussion discussant including myself will remain to continue with the, the discussion the next reminder is about the bulk of work the enormous work of Professor Robert MD. It is almost impossible to cover, cover it in this webinar or in half an hour or in his greetings. So what I have planned is we have in Japan compiled a small pamphlet with Bob, um, Professor MD's forward for Japanese translation of his selected papers together combined with all the lists of these presentations and papers. So therefore, I'm negotiating with the publisher to allow us to put this as a you know, digital file so that you can access it online. Okay, so it's going to be a limited time and limited forum, but I hope it will become a nice, you know, gate into the world of emotional world of infancy, focusing and honoring um, Bob Ro Emeritus Professor Robert MD. Now let's start with Professor MD's greeting. honor for me 
to welcome you to this webinar of the World Association of Infant Mental Health. Uh, I am so grateful to all of you, to the colleagues and fellow students of mental health presenting here, extending our work, and grateful especially to the many of you who are joining this webinar. We learn from our past challenges and opportunities as we continue to help each other as healthcare workers and as developmental educators and researchers during these very difficult times. Spitz showed us with his filmed observations in the 1940s that separated babies suffer and parents suffer with depression, grief, and that their reunions, along with compassion and developmental organizers with others over time, can make a positive difference. He told me during his dying days that he wanted his words to be remembered as survival, adaptation, and evolution. I thought of those words often, and I do now. In our world of infant mental health, these days, we're in the process of surviving our COVID pandemic. How are we adapting? What can we learn from our work in infant mental health about development, prevention, and evolving? What can we learn in sharing our experiences now in helping and educating for the next generations? <clears throat> As has been mentioned, um, this webinar is among the first in a series bridging to the next already deferred WAME Brisbane Congress in September 2021. That will be a hybrid, both attended there and virtually by internet. The vaccines against our current pandemic virus, we know, are expected to be approved by the beginning of the new year, soon to be upon us. And our hopes will be for significant distributions of that vaccine, those vaccines leading up to next September. But we are still due for continuing very difficult times of social stress amidst our hopefulness up to next September and beyond. The topics of the webinar will deal with what our programs of research have learned about the infant's emotional capacities and needs. These have evolved for us as humans and require our attention and love in caregiving. We are emotional, socio-emotional beings at birth and beyond. Infants are endowed as Dr. Hisako will review for, with capacities for reciprocity, emotional communication and empathy and what we refer to as value, valuation REV, um, evaluation referring to by others, a uh, sense of mastery, of curiosity, uh, of getting it right about the world, what Piaget called cognitive assimilation, REV. Um, we like to say they are endowed, infants are endowed, we are endowed 
with these capacities for developing and that infants are developing a social moral moral self and we like to use the word endowed to emphasize that a lot is there that needs to be helped, that needs to be cared for, that needs to be protected, that needs to be nourished, that needs to be educated. That's the work that we do. Um, that's the work that parents do. So, um, and it's also connected with a lot we have learned and can learn more about uh, amidst ourselves with other cultures and experiences and a particular uh, one of our group has been uh, experiences of uh, in Japan of Amai as what Takeo Doi elaborated as Amai and uh, Dr. Hisako will be talking more about that and her applications of that at many levels. Um, uh, others will be, uh, I think Dr. Oppenheimer will be talking about a moral self and about his work uh, in parents in um, um, uh, their capacities, evaluating their capacities and helping with their capacities about insightfulness concerning the developing social self and work that he began with us and continues um, internationally as we all do in our organization of WAME. Um, and um, uh, yeah, what he calls parental and family insightfulness about infant uh, and early development and emotional development. And then we will have a presentation on uh, relationships, all involves relationships and emotional sharing uh, uh, and a, uh, I believe, a presentation on triadic relationships, um, the baby developing with mother and with father and others in the family and uh, what we've learned about that. All of these involve more questions than what we've learned about, uh, and that's what we are about in our organization, our Congress, and in our webinars as we move towards a fuller exchange in our Brisbane Congress in September. Um, I, I, uh, I'm in mind of a personal story. Uh, my daughter came over with her dog, who's a um, mix of Australian Shepherd and um, Border Collie very smart dog, shows these three features, not like infants, but we went out on the porch, he's a very loving dog and does, actually does some caregiving work himself as a caregiver dog. Uh, and he just loves to um, play games. You throw a ball and come back and he looked up with pleading eyes, please throw the ball. And I did and he retrieved it. And he's so happy doing that. Um, and he loves to explore. So these things are in our evolutionary biology, these capacities, but they're highly evolved, highly needy, uh, and a needing of um, development. And they're still evolving. And how are we going to help that? How are we going to predict, predict it? How are we going to behave uh, in this next terribly difficult time when many people will think the vaccines are right there and why can't I have them? Uh, when we're dealing with issues of uh, needy populations as well as uh, in poverty and in migration uh, and so many other ways and in times of um, climate change uh, and fires and uh, floods and disasters and um, and how are we going to be able to become more one world 
uh, joining our cultures, learning from each other, and helping each other as helpers too, as health uh, caregivers. Uh, we're trying to work in this country to help each other as caregivers because they're especially vulnerable. We are vulnerable. We have conflicts ourselves. We have frustrations. We have huge stresses. Uh, and that's another part of WAME, to help each other uh, as we go through these and to tell each other how we can help each other uh, and uh, over these times leading up to September in Brisbane and beyond. Uh, and um, think about, I guess, not necessarily eternity, but going beyond for uh, generations to come. So um, again, I, I welcome you to this and thank you for the honor of uh, thoughts you've had of uh, presenting it um, in, in my honor, which I'm told has happened. And I'm uh, eager to, um, to go forward and to um, Wish I could be with you at the time of the seminar, but for circumstances, I cannot be. So thank you, and I'll say onward. It's so nice to be encouraged by Bob onward. So let's go, go ahead. Well, I would like to present my talk, but it will be shortened because of the, the because of time and so i hope i can just touch on something which would be a little bit useful for newcomers and people from other parts of the world now let me just start from here The title of my, you know, um, talk is Explorations in the Emotional World of Infancy from Winnespitz to MD and Beyond. And Beyond includes many, many colleagues who worked, who was mentored um, with and by Bob, MD, and including us and the coming generation. Well, to be honest, I'm a child psychiatrist who started learning about child psychiatry from Rune Spitz. Rune Spitz was a rare doctor, medical doctor and psychiatrist who said babies have feelings, which was really mind boggling. He said they become sad, hopeless and depressed. He also pointed out that Darwin emphasized the centrality of emotions for human survival, adaptation, and evolution. Well, in Japan, after the war, centrality of techniques, technology was emphasized, but emotion was sort of discarded as mess or rubbish. It was spit who is stroking the head of the baby and observing the plight of babies separated from their secure world. From Bob, from Bob, let me just call Bob. <laughs> it's about Robert um, MD, from Professor Robert MD. I was told that the ending words of René Spitz was survival, adaptation, and evolution. Well, what a strong and powerful, you know, words, which is very crucial to us now. Well, as a child psychiatrist born after the war, I was faced with impossible new cases of anorexia and school refusal and abuse and so on, which never existed before in Japan. So I learned a lot from um, Spitz. And I joined 
passed away in 1986 at the third you know, World Congress in Stockholm. And I was mesmerized by the warmth and the eagerness of all of the participants and speakers in trying to ask what's going on inside the mind, the world, the inner world of the baby. And at that time, and even now though, um, it is important to emphasize that, you know, it was very active. Wayne was very active. And as you see here, Wayne was presenting in French Parliament. And they were trying to change the, 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 you know, the country of France. And this they did. Levovisi here, Kramer here, and many, many people here. But in, the, in that Congress, I showed this slides of baby sleeping in the, um, you know, between mom and dad or co-sleeping and being at, with, um, at one with nature. And this was very strange to French people. And I also realized how different the cultural, you know, effects influences are. At the same time, WayPad, which is mainly based with child psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, was trying to be combined with International Association of Infant Mental Health, led by you know, Dr. Sophia Wemperad and High Fitzgerald. And in 1992, they merged, and you can see Jorosowski, Levovici, High Fitzgerald, Dr. Sonia, and here. Justin Cole and Bob MD, Catherine Barnard and Zina, Charlie Zina and so on. Now there were, you know, so many stars like the universe. And I was mesmerized. And it freed me from the constraints of Japanese culture and academism. And so I plunged into way. And I, and there, I observed with awe the fierce fight that Daniel Stern, Debovisi, and Bob and others were carrying out in the sphere of psychoanalytic world. And in 1996, I was honored to be invited to present a videotape case on transgenerational transmission of you know, wartime and post-war trauma in Japan. But look at this, you know, this, oh, sorry, look at this eyes, glittering eyes of Bob. And at that time, already, Bob was thinking about our moral endowments from infancy. He was optimistic, and he welcomed us, and he was eager to learn from us. And already then, he was thinking about three basic moral functions given us by evolutionary biology and existing in infancy as vital functions. And he was researching meticulously, one after the others, many aspects of development in infancy. So I remember the research of Visual Cliff carried out with Joseph Campos or affective core self, or empathy, and also we go experiment. In this we go experiment, which was carried out for young you know, infants, I was surprised to see a group of children, well, just around the age of three, four, five, telling each other, not to touch the glittering, attractive toy left on the table. Why? Because the teacher said not to. And he clarified that we have, we, we go, the sense of social self, 
from very, very early on. And this resonated with our new traditional culture of Amae, which was paying respect to everybody around you. And they will respect you as a person in your own right. So in 1992, Hisako, I just want to give you a, a notice of five minutes, if you could okay, wrap okay. up five minutes. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much. He was already writing those, and he was always, already studying about Amai Takeodoi. And Amai derives from the word Amai, meaning sweet. And it's to do with the sweet memories of the secure womb life. And he said, the infant's affection towards its mother, interpersonal relationship in Japan, they are linked. Lived intimacy and tacit understanding, implicit among us, is a kind of, you know, amniotic fluid-like, trustful sort of fluid, fluid kind of atmosphere in which each one of the group feels that it is taken for granted to be taken good care of. But actually in Japan, I was faced with very difficult cases such as a very low birth weight of 256 gram baby. This is like a deprived baby of spit, deprived from the mother's womb. And then we had orphans. And how do we retrieve their lost in intimacy of infancy? And also we had increasing numbers of girls from an anorexia. And with my colleague, pediatric colleagues, I developed a KO method of intensive care and a unit, ANICU, anorexia nervosa intensive care and unit. And one of our patients became an artist and produced this poem, deep down in every heart lies things long forgot, each of us, a baby in arms, each of us once wrapped in someone's arms, such sweet little memories. I was surprised, they know it. The mother and baby, the mother and child know it. And then in 2009, MD produced this paper from Ego to Wego, which made sense to me. In Japan, we were trying to catch up with the West to become individualized and independent, but that's not right for us. Let's retrieve our we go. So Amae and REV are very, very linked and similar. They seem to resonate with each other. And all of the you know, problems, emotional and psychosocial problems of children in Japan seems to be linked with this interruption of love, the effects of relationships on relationships. You know, very tired father shouting shut up and the mother becoming depressed and so on. And also there is another very big task which is unresolved conflicts of the past. So ghosts in the nursery, transgenerational transmission of conflicts is every in Japan. And in addition to this, in 2011, we had the big, greatest Japan earthquake and tsunami and radiation accident. Well, my student was a pediatrician, was in Fukushima. This is Dr. Kikuchi. And lo and behold, in Fukushima, people were really, you know, working together. REV was very clear in Fukushima. And they were ready to wrap, protect the children of the local area with embracing and comforting mothers. And they quickly made, before Christmas that year, the largest indoor playground in Koryama, Fukushima. And here you see Kayapura. And here you see her helping 
the team of health business. And here you see former past president Mary Karen visiting a densely, severely radiated, deserted, you know, school playground with um, Dr. Kalkonen, Parvi Kalkonen. So I felt we are a caring community inside Japan and outside Japan. And then this phrase resonated in me. 30 years ago, when I first met Dr. MD, he said, the fish is in the water and the water is in the fish. The fish makes me feel the fetus. The water makes me feel warm. Perhaps I surmise that Japanese ego comes out from the womb. So we will go ahead with we go. And we are a caring society. And lo and behold, in Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh, I met with a team of you know, very young and vibrant and dedicated um, workers who were taught by Dr. John Robinson, the colleague of Professor MD. And they were using in their own way, the emotional availability scale. And also this is something you can see. This is a... Um, the children in Bangladesh, in the slums. So lastly, two years ago, Professor MD came with Dr. Mary Ann Levy to Japan for two weeks. And lo and behold, what happened was that he invited a friend. Do you know? I was surprised. He invited Crown Princess Kiko to his lecture. And he really talked with a big grin in his face to her. And she is a doctor, but she is also a great advocate for early head start and child rearing support, not only in Japan, but also in Asia and the world. So lastly, endowment of morality, he said, how could we create an environment and relationship to preserve and cultivate human moral endowment. So this is our homework from Bob. Let's meet together virtually or in reality in June. Okay, thank you very much. Well, because of time, sorry, I went too far. I'd like him to invite Dr. David, Professor David Oppenheim, and he will introduce himself, please. Professor Oppenheim, come in. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hisako, for a wonderful talk and for bringing Bob into uh, our um, uh, webinar today. And welcome, everyone. It's a shame we can't see one another and communicate more directly with one another. But uh, at least we can uh, be together in this, in this way. It's a great uh, privilege for me to uh, speak to you today about uh, our work on parental insightfulness uh, in a webinar series that honors our pioneers, today honoring Bob Emdy. I did my postdoc with uh, Bob in the late 1980s. And what stands out in my memory from those days, beyond Bob's incredible breadth of interests and depth of knowledge, is his generous and warm facilitation and encouragement of students, of postdocs like myself and scholars from the US and elsewhere who often came to visit. Our professional and academic lives, as many of you know, I'm sure, too often highlight polarities of opinion, individual rather than team achievement and competition. And Bob's integrative and positive approach was and is a refreshing voice, a voice which I try to keep within me and pass on to others. I can easily trace the work I will be talking about today to the work I did with Bob 
in the late 80s, we shared a curiosity and belief in the importance of family relationships for children's socio-emotional development with a particular emphasis on how children learn to make meaning from their positive and negative experiences and what role parents and the family environment plays in that process, facilitating coherent, positive, competent representations or representations that are less helpful in that regard. Today, I will focus on one piece of that affective meaning-making process, how parents see the world from their children's perspective, a constructive act in which the parents' past and current relationships and their own emotional resources play an incredibly important role, and a process that we believe has enormous impact on children's emotional development and mental health. Let me share my PowerPoint presentation at this point. And just show you, this is Haifa, my, my hometown, where I'm talking to you from right now. Um, so parental insightfulness, a work that I've been doing in collaboration with my colleague uh, and friend, Nina Koren Kari. So what is it? seeing and feeling things from the child's point of view. Uh, so we've identified the following elements that comprise this kind of parental attitude. Uh, insight into the motives that underlie behavior. So understanding that behavior, outward behavior has feelings, thoughts, needs, motives that are underneath it. Separateness, realizing that the child, the infant, um, has um, needs and, and um, feelings that are uh, separate from those that we have and being able to separate one from the other. Acceptance of the child, particularly challenging behavior or disappointing behavior that are different from what the parent expects or wants. Holding an emotionally complex view of the child, seeing the child as a whole person with a variety of qualities, attributes, some of them uh, may be more um, what the parent wants and some of them may be less so or more challenging. And the last element, openness regarding the child and the self. That is the capacity to change one's um, view of the child or oneself when there is conflicting evidence. The child is behaving in ways that are different than what you expected. Parental insightfulness, not only maternal, as it says here on the slide, I'll, sh I'll show you in a minute. It's part of the sensitivity construct as defined by Mary Ainsworth. She says, a, a, she said, a sensitive mother sees things from the child's point of view. And it's the basis for sensitive and emotionally regulating and nurturing parental behavior. So it's kind of like the internal piece of what we then observe um, and it can explain sensitivity but and and the positive aspects but also the less facilitative aspects of parenting um, so it's therefore it's the basis for a secure child mother attachment uh, the child who experiences insightful parenting feels safely held in the mind of the parent insightfulness is embedded in everyday routines it is not some aha moment that you figure out um, it is actually what parents use continuously with, particularly with infants and young children who are nonverbal and who, um, who change very rapidly uh, with development. Um, and parents see it as their job to figure it out, um, what's, what's going on. Uh, both insight and empathy, acceptance are needed. So there's an element to it which, which is more cognitive, if you will, what, what's going on in my child's head. But it's not just um, contemplation. It is, it is uh, geared towards um, empathic understanding of the child's experience. That doesn't mean that every, every um, uh, parenting behavior guided by insightfulness will necessarily be experienced positively by the child, obviously. Parents do things that don't make their kids happy at the moment, but can still 
be guided by an insightful stance. This uh, idea, these ideas may sound familiar to, to some of you, to many of you, uh, similar to um, uh, Freiberg's Ghost in the Nursery, uh, Alicia Lieberman talked about negative maternal attributions. The adult attachment interview developed by Mary Main has been an influence and Liz Maines talked about mind-mindedness a related construct and Arietta Slade and Peter Fonagy with their notions of mentalization and parental reflective functioning. If what I talked about and will talk about sounds similar to these uh, concepts, it is, uh, it is similar. Uh, there are differences, I won't get into the differences right now, but uh, certainly our main goal was to develop a research um, uh, procedure to assess these, um, these clinical constructs, if you will, and that was something that we've been busy doing for more than 20 years. And I will share with you little tidbits and highlights of our uh, research work. Um, if you're interested, there is a great meta-analysis written by a young Dutch uh, researcher, uh, Monica Zegers, uh, uh, published in Psych Bulletin. And um, you can see it, you can get an overview of the concepts and the um, research studies that support uh, its validity. So um, from all of this theoretical discussion to the practicalities of assessing it, the way we assess uh, insightfulness is it's a video replay procedure. You show the mother or the father um, three videotaped um, short segments of the child's behavior with the mother, with the father, with others, and, and then you interview the mother. You ask her what she thought was going on in the child's mind, what, what he was thinking, what he was feeling, is it typical of this child? Uh, does it show you something about his um, uh, traits uh, more generally? Um, and, and what were you feeling? And we think it's very significant to have to refer to a video segment rather than just be asked these questions generally about examples the parents might be talking about, which we often do in clinical work anyway. But there's something about having to refer to a video and to apply what you know about your child to a piece of behavior that comes from life. Um, you're not prepared, you just watch it and then you react to it. Uh, more similar to what happens uh, when we interact with our kids. Um, it's very interesting that parents are not rated on the accuracy of their perceptions. Even though they're watching a video, we are not asking whether or not they are accurate. Rather, we ask ourselves, how do parents organize their thoughts and feelings in relation to the child and the child's inner world? That seems to be the critical piece for insightfulness. So it's more the narrative they create than the accuracy of their perceptions. We classify the transcripts of the interviews into four classifications. Um, one, insightful, characterized by the complexity, insight, acceptance, and openness, which I've talked about. And then three additional classifications, three different types of lack of insightfulness. Um, the one-sided um, classification, lack of complexity, problems maintaining focus, anger, and in some parents, insight combined with rejection. So it's as if there is the cognitive component, but not the emotional, empathic component. Uh, on the other side, perhaps, of the emotion regulation um, continuum is the disengaged um, classification, lack of interest in the child's inner world, emphasis on behavior, but not on the underlying motives, and emphasis on child self-sufficiency. And then there is another category that we identified where the parents have a mixed style belonging to several of these uh, in one interview. Um, our first step coming from the world of attachment was to see whether these insightfulness classification, which characterize the mother's, the father's way of thinking and feeling about the child's inner world, whether they're associated with attachment in the way one would predict um, coming from um, attachment theory. And we, we found that in two separate studies of typically developing children, uh, that uh, mothers who were insightful were more likely to have, most likely to have security attached children, 
mothers who were one-sided were more likely, most likely to have insecure, ambivalent children. Mothers who were classified as mixed had insecure, disorganized children. And with the disengaged category, we did not find the expected link to avoidance. But in Israel, we don't have we have only very, very few children with avoidant classification. So maybe that can explain uh, this uh, lack of expected association. So the first take home message uh, is that we showed uh, empirically that insightfulness is associated with a secure uh, attachment. So then we asked, what about fathers? Um, and we did a study of about 80 families of toddlers, 18-month-old toddlers, low risk, again, typically developing low risk families. And we assessed both maternal and paternal insightfulness. And we assessed the family uh, interacting together in the Lausanne Trilogue play procedure developed by Elizabeth Pivaz from Lausanne and her colleagues. And I think Dan Philip later on will also mention this, uh, this procedure, uh, which is both a research procedure and a clinical procedure to observe families uh, interacting together and to classify the type of family alliance that they have. The first finding from the study, there were no differences in the rates of insightfulness between mothers and fathers. So fathers were not less likely nor more likely to be classified as insightful compared to uh, mothers, which is uh, um, an important uh, finding for those of us who are uh, who believe that research in, in our field should involve fathers more uh, than it uh, has done till now. Um, and the other um, uh, very nice finding uh, was this association between the insightfulness of both parents and the type of family alliance. So insightfulness associated through an interview, family alliance uh, measured, assessed in, in uh, observation. And what you find is the following, when both parents are insightful, um, the alliance uh, um, assessed in the Lausanne trilogue play is cooperative. That's the most optimal uh, um, uh, alliance, family alliance. If one parent is insightful and the other is not insightful, it doesn't matter if it's mom or dad, you end up with a conflictual alliance. Uh, and if neither parent is insightful, and we had families like that, even in this low risk sample, then you end up with a disordered alliance. So there is a nice match here between this kind of couple level insightfulness and this family uh, alliance as observed. So that's the take home message number two. Insightfulness of mothers and fathers is associated with the, the family alliance, this time at the family level. So the next step was taking this insightfulness uh, idea and moving into the world when, of autism. Why autism? Child autism, that is. Why autism? Because you can easily uh, say or think that Figuring out the motives, what makes a child with autism tick, seeing the world from the child's point of view in the case of autism is really difficult. And we kind of are like pushing the theory to its limit. Is it possible to be insightful with respect to a child with autism? Yeah. And does it have the same expected association with secure attachment? So two questions that guided this research? Well, the first answer is already on the slide. Just look at the uh, light blue piece of the, of the pie chart. 42% of the mothers um, showed uh, insightfulness with respect to their young children with autism spectrum disorder. That's less than what you see in typical development, but it's certainly you know, uh, uh, a significant uh, group. In fact, it's the largest group um, of all the other of all the insightfulness uh, assessments, uh, classifications. So insightfulness is possible uh, with respect, even with respect to children who are very challenging. And this has a lot of implications, I think, for work with kids with autism, but also kids with other kinds of special needs and something we're very interested in. And then the next question, and I'll walk you through the slide, uh, this is a more quantitative type of slide. Uh, the next question was, 
is it associated with secure attachment in the same way as we saw in typical development? And the answer is yes. And it shows on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, it says R plus I under this bar, uh, re resolved and insightful, because with respect to children with a diagnosis, part of insightfulness is also being resolved, coming to terms with the child's diagnosis. And you see that when you have resolve, when, when mothers are resolved and insightful, the likelihood that the child will have a secure attachment is very high, the, the vast majority of the children. But in the other groups, the far left group, uh, unresolved and non-insightful, and even if you have one of the two, uh, that's the middle bar, you see that the rates of secure attachment uh, are much lower. There are a few kids, uh, but the rates are much lower. So we see essentially the same kind of association between insightfulness and attachment, secure attachment, that we saw in typical development. We see it even in the, if you will, extreme case of, uh, of a child um, with, with, uh, with autism. So it speaks to the power and the importance uh, of this concept uh, of insightfulness that can be applied also when the child has significant difficulties. Uh, let me now uh, review a little bit of a different angle on um, insightfulness. This time, insightfulness as a buffer for children exposed to violence. A dissertation work done by Sarah Gray in Boston uh, under the, the, the supervision or guidance of Alice Carter. Um, so here the question was a little bit different. Um, it was um, with respect to buffering the effects of children's exposure to violence, community violence. Um, does insightfulness help the children not develop uh, symptomatology? So we know that in general, children exposed to violence, there is an association with uh, developing various kinds of symptoms, but is, can this association be buffered or moderated uh, by uh, insightfulness? That is, of course, uh, a core element of why insightfulness is important to protect uh, and from stress becoming toxic stress. And the results that uh, Sarah got were, were beautiful. So what you can see here in this slide is on the right-hand side, these are the children of uh, mothers who were not insightful. And you can see that those who were exposed had many more internalizing behavior problems than those who were not exposed. So you can see the effect, the negative effect of violent exposure on children's behavior problems. But if you look at the left-hand side of this graph, you find that when kids, when, when the mothers, when the kids were protected by the insightfulness of, of the mother, the, they did not develop the, these symptoms. I think uh, it doesn't mean that they're not impacted. Of course, children will be impacted um, by being exposed to scary, frightening, violent uh, uh, events in their uh, community. But um, the insightfulness, perhaps the insightfulness of the, of the mother in this case, the parents more generally, helps contain this and prevent it from becoming uh, a more, um, uh, more serious uh, symptom. Uh, David, five more minutes. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so um, the, the final piece I want to uh, mention to you uh, as, as people I know many, many of you are involved in various kinds of interventions and to think about insightfulness as a moderator of treatment effectiveness. That is, uh, some of the parents you work with um, are insightful. I, I mean prior to treatment. I don't mean insightfulness as the goal for treatment, but they come equipped with a good capacity to see things from the child's point of view. The child still may have all kinds of difficulties, uh, but and others are not. Um, and does that have an impact on the on the uh, efficacy uh, of the intervention you're offering? And Michael Siller uh, offered an intervention, family uh, play intervention, for 
parents of children with autism spectrum disorder, and he assessed insightfulness um, prior to the intervention. And, and what he discovered, um, I mean, he actually was, was uh, hoping to see gains in insightfulness. But uh, in fact, what he saw was that insightfulness of the parents acted as a moderator of the treatment effectiveness. So on the left-hand side, you see the gains that um, the mothers made in their synchrony, uh, in their synchronization with their children. And you see that the experimental group, that is the treatment arm, uh, improved from pre to post uh, in, uh, in, in a significant way um, compared to um, the ones who did not get the intervention. But you, need, you see no such gains in the non-insightful mothers. So they were exposed to the same kind of intervention, but maybe their capacity to use this intervention to uh, in a flexible, appropriate way, apply it uh, in their interactions with their uh, children was, um, was, uh, was, less, was less good. So uh, I think we can all think about, think about parents we are trying to help in working with them and their children and uh, whether this capacity that is already uh, uh, present in some of, some of the parents prior to treatment, how important it is or the application of the kind of things we try to help parents see. Uh, and when, it's, uh, when there are barriers to insightfulness, maybe this is something that we need to work on in a way before we get to the other aspects of the um, intervention. So um, I think that um, I will uh, stop at this point. Um, I, I regret not having a, an opportunity to um, answer questions or hear from you and whether uh, you feel this, uh, this uh, sounds familiar to you in your work. Um, I will stay as long as needed after the presentation. Um, and I hope very much to, to see you, um, um, maybe by Zoom, who knows, maybe a miracle will happen and we'll actually be able to physically be in Brisbane in June, it's June, not September. Um, but um, but if not, then via Zoom and the other kind of ways virtually to see you uh, and to be able to engage more and hear from you, um, your reactions to this and just to hear from you in general. So thank you very much. And I'm passing this back to um, Hisako to introduce our final uh, speaker for today. Now, our next speaker is Diane Philip. Um, already, um, Campbell has introduced you, so I would you know, let you go, invite you to go ahead into your talk, please. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. I am <laughs> to you from Toronto, Canada, where it is currently minus five degrees and the sun has <laughs> Um, and I wish to acknowledge that uh, where I'm speaking to you from is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Na Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the ha Haudenosaunee, and the Wandat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. I would also like to acknowledge that Toronto is also covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. I'm really excited to be um, sharing this Zoom uh, webinar with such amazing uh, mentors and um, pioneers in this field. And um, what I'm going to be talking about today is some of the work we've been doing here at my center, Sick Kids Center for Community Mental Health, formerly, formerly Stalcrest Center, um, which is the University of Toronto uh, teaching site. And, and what we're doing is probably what we've been doing is probably what many of you as clinicians and researchers have been doing to accommodate to this current situation that we're all in. So I have here, um, so I'm going to be talking about how we adapted to the pandemic. And I have my email at the bottom, and I'm just going to stay here for a moment because 
uh, like others have said, we don't have the opportunity for questions and comments. And I'm open to both questions as well as suggestions because we're all figuring this out together. And the end goal is to be able to try to provide uh, services in a very difficult time when services are even more needed. Um, and so um, I'm open to people asking me questions, but also maybe saying, hey, you know, maybe you could do this better and here's an idea. So let's plow forward. Um, so here are some babies in my clinic um, that I have not seen since March 13th. And one of the things I've been thinking about lately is all of these babies that have been born since the pandemic started. And what is going to happen with these children as we move forward in, uh, you know, not too distant future hopefully but distant enough that some of them will have had a whole bunch of experiences in this very isolated um, world that we're living in currently so i've wondered a lot about that the other thing i'm also going to say is that these babies don't have covid masks on and they don't have any masks on but for the remainder of my presentation many of the people that you'll be seeing in the slides will have little clouds that i've put on their faces just for their um, privacy so i apologize for the odd looking um, slides um, but that is the reason for that because uh, i wanted to be able to show you pictures of people and and the kind of work we're doing but i also wanted to protect their privacy so um, before I go forward in time to where we are now, um, I wanted to just spend a moment going backwards and talking about how we did things in our clinic prior to um, the pandemic. Um, and as David mentioned, um, I do work with the LTP, the Lausanne Trilog Play Paradigm. So I'm going to speak a little bit about that. Um, and so um, I'm just going to talk like I said, a bit about how things worked before the pandemic. So um, we all view babies as coming into the world um, and in, into a world that is, as um, Hisako mentioned in her presentation, a fish within water and the water's in the fish. And so I love that um, met, uh, image that she presented from what Bob had said to her, Bob MD had said to her, the idea that babies come into the world and they're in, um, they're nested in a bunch of, uh, of systems. Um, they come with often two or more caregivers, and it doesn't have to be a mother and a father. It can be a mother and her own mother. It could be a variety of combinations of caregivers, but it's usually more, uh, very often more than one. Um, they also often come with siblings. And the pearls of wisdom that we know from um, family therapists uh, include things like the sum of the parts is not equal to the whole. Um, and James McHale, who's another colleague who really focuses on the idea of multi-person families, um, has done some lovely studies back uh, a number of years ago looking at this idea of the sum of the parts. And so I'm just going to mention two of them. But the model he used was to look at the family interacting together as a whole, so with two parents and a baby, um, and then also to look at the different dyads, so the mother and the baby interacting, as well as the father and the baby interacting. These were heterosexual couples that he was working with. And what these two studies that I wanted to mention um, that he did with some of his um, colleagues are one in which where there was high co-parental conflict, um, the parents actually looked better, more sensitive, more attuned, um, better at responding to their children when they were alone in the room with their child as opposed to when they were with the whole family interacting. And the thinking there is that when there's a lot of conflict in the couple, they are more drawn into what's going on in the couple situation and less able to respond in a sensitive, attuned way to their child. The flip side story of that was with some depressed mothers who had good a good co-parental, a good marital relationship. There wasn't high conflict in the in the couple. Um, and these mothers actually looked better when they were in the room with their partner interacting with their baby. They were more sensitive, more attuned, more playful. Um, and it's almost as though the presence of the father provided some sort of scaffolding for these mothers. So it's important to consider that there should be more than one portal of entry when we assess families. So in our clinic, we observe them interacting both in these individual dyads, so watching our identified client interact 
in semi-structured tasks that we give them in a dyad alone with their mother and in a dyad alone with alone with one parent and in a dyad alone with the other parent or caregiver and then we also watch them interacting in as a whole family with siblings as well we also ask families about their family and how the interactions work because um, I, today I'm going to be talking a lot about observational tools, um, but I just want to underscore that we also have a number of ways of asking families both directly as well as using um, paper and pencil scales that we sent, send home with them as part of a very comprehensive um, assessment process that we do in our infant and preschool teams. So here we have the Lausanne Trilogue Play Paradigm, which as David mentioned was developed by Elizabeth Fiva de Persange and Antoinette Corbeau Warnery. It's been around for many decades and a number of sites have used it, both for research purposes as well as clinically. Um, and so uh, the family comes in here, they're coming into the lab, but in our center, they're coming into the um, clinic. Um, and I'll show you a slide in a moment what it looks like in our clinic. Um, but this is actually in Lausanne. And the couple is asked to play together with their baby or child in four parts. So in part one, they're told one of you will play while the, uh, with your baby while the other one is simply present. And when it feels right, after a certain period of time, you're going to switch roles. So if you look over um, on the upper left-hand corner, that's part one. Upper right-hand corner is part two. And you can clearly see in part one, dad's playing with baby. In part two, mom is playing with baby. Um, and the other parent is simply present, resonating with the experience, enjoying the play without either excluding themselves by looking away or interfering by coming in too close or saying things. In part three, when it feels right, um, you're gonna move on to play together as a family. Um, and you can imagine this baby looking back and forth between their two um, parents who are playing this lovely little hand game um, and enjoying the play together. And in part four, when it feels right, you will move on to have a discussion amongst adults while your baby manages on their own. And again, you can imagine the baby looking back and forth thinking, hey, what happened? I was interacting with you guys. It was so fun. Maybe protesting a little bit, maybe trying to reintroduce that hand game to try to get their attention back. And the parents are creating what Salvador Mnuchin referred to as a clear but flexible boundary. So they're interacting with each other, they're paying attention to each other, but not so rigidly that if their baby truly needed them and needed their attention, they would then attend to their baby. And so we've um, been able to study these families over um, many years now, um, and we get have developed ways of understanding um, their interactions and have come up with coding systems for the family alliance, which David mentioned in his talk, um, as well as the co-parenting um, capacity of the parents um, and how well the child can manage this multi-person relationship. The um, LTP has been adapted for various ages and stages and can also be used in the prenatal period um, where they use a um, doll for the parents to interact with. It's always in these four parts. Um, first one parent, then the other parent, then everybody together, and then the parents talk on their own while the child manages. Um, and in older age groups, toys are introduced and those are standardized, as is the table that the family sits at. Um, it's been the, the these this these uh, children in Lausanne. It's a cohort, a community sample have been studied and followed since the parents were expecting their first child at seven months gestation, and um, the data for the fifteen year olds is currently being analyzed. Um, and without intervention, these different family alliances, um, cooperative and problematic, and there are um, three to four different um, types of alliances, remain fairly stable. So here we are in my clinic, and that's me, um, talking to some parents. And what we did pre-pandemic was an initial intake, usually with the whole family, um, but sometimes with just the parents, to find out what the concerns were um, and to give them these um, paper and pencil tasks. 
we then bring, would bring them back into the clinic to do our own version of an LTP. So here we have a little baby and his parents. They're in part three of an LTP. They've all discovered the spoons. So um, standardized toys, toy, the toys are tele play phones, uh, spoons, uh, little animals and um, socks. Um, and so here they are playing with the spoons and they're all feeding the uh, dinosaurs until baby Harry gets very excited and swipes everything off the table as babies of this age do. Um, we also do the Lausanne family play. So here we have a family of four. Um, and unfortunately, my parents are not positioned quite in the right spot. They should actually be at the ends of the table, not facing the children, but more angled towards the children from the ends of the table. Um, but the Lausanne family play paradigm, um, you ask the family to play again in these same four parts, but um, the children are treated as a unit. So first one parent plays with both children while the other parent is simply present. They then switch roles. And then in part three, the family is asked to try to come together in a, in a game that they can all play together. And in part four, the parents um, are asked to chat while the children manage on their own. We also um, do the, we're, we were occasionally doing the Lausanne picnic game, but not regularly. Um, and in this task, we asked the parents uh, the family rather to plan a picnic a pretend picnic um, travel to the pretend picnic have the picnic and then travel back from the pretend picnic and all of these tasks by the way i should mention un are last for about 10 to 12 minutes so that would include the um the lausanne family play as well as the ltp these are all 10 to 12 minute tasks except with very young infants then we tend to Give them eight to ten minutes. So in this Lausanne picnic, um, they're playing this game together um, and it's about ten to twelve minutes. And at the end of all of these tasks, we ask the parents to signal us when they're done. We also do dyadic assessment, like I mentioned, so a different portal of entry. Um, and in that, we um, use the Rose, we've adapted Roseanne Clark's dyadic assessment tool. So we have a block construction task as well as a um, free play and a separation reunion task. Then we bring parents back and we provide some treatments. So some of it is parent only, like here, for example, where we might do video feedback based on those um, video assessments we've done or parent guidance um, with um, behavioral, parent guidance that's informed with behavioral strategies or mentalization based therapy. So the insight, um, kind of work that David was talking about, as well as our own homegrown Toronto emotion-focused family therapy, which is also an attachment-based treatment. Um, we also at our center provide more intensive services where we bring families in to do therapies, such as Watch, Wait and Wonder. Oh, by the way, I should mention all of the people in these pictures are friends of mine or friends of friends or colleagues. So they're just posing for these shots over the years. Um, so here we have a, a therapist on the left doing Watch, Wait and Wonder with a mum. So in Watch, Wait and Wonder, uh, there is um, an initial 20 minute play period. It might be younger for a baby, uh, sh shorter for a baby this young. Um, a play period and then a discussion with uh, the parent about what they observed during the play. And the whole goal is to work on the parent's insightfulness, the parent's capacity to mentalize their baby and understand the meaning of their baby's behavior and what might be going on for the baby to put themselves in the baby's shoes. Reflective family play uh, is also, these are homegrown at my site, these two treatments, um, is um, also like most treatments, as we know in the infant and preschool population, play with, the, there's some sort of play component, component and then discussion with the therapist. So in reflective family play, we use the same um, four parts of the LTP um, and we ask parents to play with their children in those four parts, but we folded in some other instructions about following the baby's lead and trying to be mindful about what might be going on for the baby. And then in reflective family play, we use um, video to support a discussion about the parent's observations and to help again with this idea of insightfulness, but also to get them more attuned to their co-parenting relationship. And then the pandemic hit. Um, one of my colleagues and her husband developed this uh, 
uh, very Canadian image, including both metric and um, imperial <laughs> distances for people to keep. Um, so the pandemic hit and suddenly we had to um, shift very quickly. So um, for us, um, March 13th was the last day our clinic was open and by March 16th we were closed. Um, and within a week, we were actually up and running and seeing the families that were on um, that we had already started with and um, eventually started pulling families off the wait list and have not stopped providing treatment throughout this time. Um, and I think one of the, um, the overriding themes of all the things that I just presented to you in terms of the assessment strategies we use as well as the treatments is that um, anything that involves the children, we're asking the parents to play with the children. So in clinic, we did sometimes, time permitting on play assessment days, have the clinician play with the child, but that was sort of um, only a time permitting thing, like the Lausanne picnic was only a time permitting thing. Um, mostly we just had um, the parents playing with their children, both for assessment and for treatment. Um, and so it became um, kind of, straightforward to move online because it meant that now we just had the parents playing with their children in their homes. So I'm going to move forward to the next slide where I'm going to show you what our assessments look like now. So um, here we have um, a little girl with her two parents doing an LTP in home. I um, filmed this using um, Zoom um, and I uh, am sitting in my little laptop here on their coffee tape, on their dining room table. Um, we um, needed to consult when to, in order to set this up we need to consult with our IT team with our privacy officer as well as our records department because actually we were old school prior to pandemic we did not have an electronic medical record everything we did was on paper and our videos were all done through DVDs so we had to figure out everything very quickly how are we going to store these things where were we going to store these things the bottom line is when you use zoom for healthcare. Um, nothing gets stored on a cloud so we are immediately able to have the um, videos that we do film through zoom go straight into our um, main computer system um, so they're in a secure location they're not on in anywhere in cyberspace um, and we destroy the videos um, within two weeks of providing any video feedback so there's no um, no long-term presence of the videos um, we inform the parents of all of this both um, at the initial intake that we do um, via video conferencing. But even before that, they are asked for consent to do video conferencing um, by our intake department over the phone. Um, we then schedule them in. We do the initial intake. We don't film. Then we go on to do the filming. Um, we also ensure safety. So we make sure we have the address of where the family lives as well as a telephone number. Telephone number in case we get disconnected, lose sound, all the things that happen with Zoom. And the, um, the address is in case things go really badly and we need to get emergency services involved. Um, once all that's in place, we then send the family an information letter prior to their um, video assessment day, where we give them a list of toys. Um, and we really insist that they not go out and buy anything, um, but rather use and improvise what, with what they have at home. Um, and so all those standardized toys that we have in our clinic went out the window. Um, but families have been pretty good about getting things that approximate what we're looking for. Um, we also send them a pictogram of the setup of what we want and how they are to sit. So I actually sent this colleague the same exact letter um, that the families get and um, they were set up pretty correctly um, for this very first um, LTP. Diane, you have five minutes left. Okay, so here we are doing video feedback um, and I am talking to the family about their case. And even over here in this lower right-hand corner, you can see that the family is, the parents are watching on screen as I show them a video of them um, doing their uh, LTP. Here we are with um, the reflective family play. And um, we have a family here that set up their camera, much less space than we have in clinic, but we are able to capture on screen what they're doing in their play and then have a discussion about it that is quite fruitful at the end. Here 
here we have another shot of a family and it's quite close up. So um, there are issues with doing this in home, obviously, the technical issues that we've all been dealing with, with screens freezing, cutting out, sound loss. There's also space issues. We have a lot of marginalized families in our clinic. Um, and so many of them are in really cramped quarters and or they're using a phone and they tend to put the phone much closer to them than families that have tablets or laptops because for the discussion part, they need to come in close to talk to us and to be able to hear us. Um, so sometimes they're playing in a smaller space simply because they, they need the phone closer to them. Um, we've had people wander off. We have one dad who would weekly put something in the oven in the middle of our reflective family play discussion. Uh, phones have fallen over, children have sat in front of phones, all of these issues. But at the end of the day, we are still providing services for these families. And what we've found is that they're sticking with us. Um, they're doing the, the work, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we've, we have had to manage challenging situations um, with children getting dysregulated. And one of the advantages we've had is that sometimes parents wear buds in the ear for the second half for the discussion part of our sessions. And so we're able to coach them over the phone through the bud in the ear. Um, and we've had parents get um, uh, dysregulated. And, and some centers have opted not to continue doing treatment because they're worried about dysregulation. And my answer to them is, I'm worried about them being dysregulated and not getting anything. And so we do ensure all those safety measures um, and we just need to use the same clinical skills that we would use if we were in clinic. Um, parents can run out of a clinic dysregulated and we can't run after them and tackle them. The same issues still exist. It's just, I think our own comfort with doing it. And it is scary, but it's, some service is better than no service in this instance if it's good enough service. Um, so we did notice, and I've heard from other centers the same thing, a drop in no-show and late cancellations, which was clinically, uh, statistically significant between the period of April 1st to June 30th, comparing 2019 to 2020. And my no-show rate, I've had one more no-show since then. So, and so I suspect that this data would become even more robust. Um, so it's suggesting to us that families really want the service, they're sticking with us, they're getting help. It's not ideal but um, it is important. So some last pointers, points is that by having this access, we've been able to pick up a number of other things in terms of diagnostic uh, purposes. We've seen ticks, which we saw in clinic two on our videos, and we could show it to the parents. We've picked up signs of ASD, ADHD, certainly by the end of an assessment, kids are running all over the place. Um, they're tired and we can see those symptoms coming out. We've picked up sensory issues um, with kids actually sometimes not even wearing clothes during their assessment, and ecological validity. So in 2015, the folks in Lausanne did a study on the ecological validity of the LTP, and the one suggestion that they had at the end was that perhaps doing this in-home might improve the ecological validity, and we've um, certainly seen a lot of things that we might not have seen in clinic just by having families in their homes, which I'm sure many of you have also seen. So again, I'm curious and interested in hearing back from all of you, um, and there's my email once again, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you, David and uh, Diane, uh, for such interesting talks. And I have some reflections as I listen to everything that was shared. And I think one of the most important things for me is that while the science of so much in our world is changing, um, and we are globally all experiencing this phenomenon, um, one thing that has not changed around infant and early mental health is the importance of relationships. And that has been a constant, uh, I think, from the moment people started to recognize and understand whether it was Dr. Spitz's work or Dr. MD's work um, and even those before them. So the importance of relationships, I think, has been is a theme that, that came out really strongly in all the talks. Um, that you heard today and, and the opening remarks from Dr. MD. I think the other thing that struck me is that it still takes a village to raise a child. And again, this is, you know, a concept that is decades old, uh, but still stays the same. And I think at a time when we are experiencing um, isolation at a new level, uh, 
it's, it's overwhelming for families, uh, that level of isolation. And certainly um, in Canada, we're seeing that there's a lot of focus on the elderly. There's quite a focus on children attending school and not enough focus is being given to families with young children. Uh, and we recently did a survey and found that you know, families are feeling isolated. They're feeling challenged. Working at home with a toddler is difficult. So I think to Diane's point, um, some service is better than no service, especially when it's good quality service. So I think that that is also important. I think the other thing for me is that what the science has done over the, the last uh, two decades, and I, I'm gonna call it the, the microscopic science, is that these concepts that people like Dr. Spitz and Dr. Uh, MD and Catherine Barnhart and, and so many others have developed over the decades, we now have the microscopic science to back this, this up. We, we have a better understanding of what's happening in the brain and the significance of relationships on brain development and how those early relationships are going to influence a child's trajectory and, and later outcomes. I think for me, another piece that I'm, I'm reflecting on, and I often have this, this feeling, this view, is that the complexity of understanding how parents are perceiving their child and their relationship is not an easy task. Uh, so I think the work of Dr. Oppenheimer and his colleagues is so important. And at the same time, I think for so many practitioners, I think of uh, those who may be home visitors or working in childcare centers, where they may be actually working with families who are really struggling and, and they are the only support. This concept of parental insightfulness, it can be overwhelming. And where does one uh, begin? And I think we, we have to reflect more on how do we equip some of those frontline practitioners with some of these these skills uh, and and lastly you know as i've always said uh, one of the greatest challenges of uh, infant and early mental health is that it 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 often requires an eclectic approach it isn't about a straight and narrow path it isn't always about I'm going to use just this one intervention and I'm going to stick to it. And I think Diane spoke to that um, really well, where she's integrated uh, interventions such as Watch, Wait and Wonder into her technique and her strategy. And I think for any clinician or practitioner to really understand uh, from a family what combination is going to work best um, is a challenge. So I, I think the talks today reminded us and affirmed for us things that we, we have known, the importance of relationships, uh, but I think they've also highlighted for us uh, the, the need to, to really be more reflective, but also continue to develop and hone in the skills of a diverse group of, of practitioners around the world because so many are in that role of supporting uh, families with young children and uh, they certainly deserve as much support as we can give. So I'm not seeing any questions in the chat or the Q&A, so I'm gonna stop there. I know we've gone past our time and we'd like to conclude today's session um, with a final word from Dr. Emdi. All that we do in helping mm -hmm. uh, involves the effect of sharing mm. of relationships on other relationships. Mm. And all of these things, especially that, you know, move into the area of uh, what we value as love mm. and loving. Mm. And it's so beautifully captured for me in some of the translated works uh, and direct works in English of Takeo Roy, particularly in those of us in the early child development and yes. health field uh, who are developmentalists, mm. who are uh, optimistic and interested 
in uh, prevention as well as education as well as um, other things. Yes, yes. You know, in our, in our profession, the helping professions, and um, we come into it because we get our pleasures mm. from others, from helping others. That's mm. what turns us on. It's certainly what turned me on and I'm so grateful for in my life uh, is that I've had so many colleagues like you both, mm. <laughs> especially knowing Isako so long and who um, are wonderful. And also we all get our deep pleasures from helping others and mm. have involved uh, most often uh, mm. experiences in our early growing up of helplessness and we want to mm. help help others from mm. that. Yeah. Uh, and um, that also puts us in um, uh, the frame of mm. needing to help each other mm. <laughs> and needing to continue not mm. only life, but you know, getting support for ourselves and mm. um, dealing with conflicts that come up mm. in ourselves. Mm. Spots, pains, depressions, anxieties, um, blind spots, all of that. And um, so that's why we're into what we've just touched on, uh, helping each other. And we need to do that in these webinars, right? Yes. <laughs> or set the motion for it, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe a, a little bit optimistic way to frame it, but um, a benefit of the pandemic is that it hopefully can bring the world closer together. Ooh. You notice it's not simply an epidemic in Transylvania or something. Mm -hmm. right. It's uh, yeah. with all of us. Uh, and we all have to help each other, learn from each other. Ooh. Um, do more of what Wayne is founded upon and believes in. Mm -hmm. and learn from each other. There's mm. a lot to learn and help each other uh, uh, as uh, as regions, as cultures. Learn from each other's cultures. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for your wonderful ending message. We all feel very warm and encouraged by Bob's, you know, generosity in handing down all his wisdom, love and curiosity <laughs> and support. So let's together stay safe and healthy and help each other in the coming months ahead, which, as Bob says, warns, might be very difficult. And for those who would like to, to stay on and discuss, please do so. We are available for um, some time after this. But because of the time, we have to end here as the webinar for. Thank you everybody for coming together to learn from each other and to share our experiences with them and our curiosity. Thank you. <laughs>